Well, good morning, and I'm glad everybody's here. I see some new faces that haven't been in here before. And so uh, we will go back and mention a couple of things that uh, as we go through the class that we've talked about before uh, so that everybody's kind of up to speed with us. The, um, the interesting thing, though, that I want to start off with is to share with you um, some of the ways that the Holy Spirit works in our lives. And He does things for us that if we're watching for that and sensitive to that, and it's kind of building an awareness in the background in our minds all the time. So I was sitting in there and, and, and thinking about this uh, class. I'm sitting in there listening to Mick in his sermon. And he gets down to Ephesians 2.10. And I, I, he, he read that verse, and I thought, this is perfect for what we're going to talk about today. So I ran in here and added a slide to our slide deck real quick, and I'm calling an audible, because I want you to look with me at the last part of that verse. Good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. So think about this for a minute. When God calls us into His family and we become a Christian, He's already prepared for us things that we each will have a unique ability to do that no other Christian on the face of the earth may have. And that was kind of, you know, when I got that realization, it really kind of, kind of hit me. So... I'm getting ready and going through stuff in here a few minutes ago, and Rod Cyrus walked in. And Rod and I haven't had a chance to talk. We've not been here as much over the last two and a half years as, as too many of us have not. And Rod is very special to me. And we're talking about some of the things we're going to discuss in here. And, and I mentioned just what I told you about this passage and putting it in there. And he said, well, you know, he was talking about the way things happen with us as Christians in, in our work is that we first have to believe. You know, we've got to have that faith. But then comes hope. And he starts talking about hope in a much broader sense than what we typically uh, think about. He talked about hope being anything that we're praying for, that we have that hope that God is going to make it work out the way that He knows it needs to. And I thought, well, that's another little message from the Spirit, because those two go together. When you think about this, we've, we've talked about, the last three weeks, we have talked about our focusing on what can we do? How can we be missional? What are the, the things that we can do? The practical application of that. And I talked about focus. And, and I talked about the story of the, the guy who told the story of the quarters, where he said, focus on quarters at the beginning of a multi-day conference. And he came back at the end, and, and he kept saying that to people. What are you talking about? And he comes back at the last day of the conference and says, okay, how many of you have found quarters this week? And he got a whole bunch of hands go up. The first day, nobody raised their hand. You know, I don't find a quarter. Well, this is back in the days when we actually used change. Uh, which most of us don't anymore. You know, it's all on a piece of plastic. But the point was well taken, and that was it, we, we get what we focus on. Well, isn't hope another way of saying the same thing? If we're believing that God is going to do and that He's already prepared for us a work, it's kind of sobering when you think that there is a person around us in this community that you may be the only one who can say the right word at the right time to them in the right way because of your personality or your relationship that will ultimately end up in them becoming a Christian or restoring. Maybe they haven't been to church anywhere in a long time and, and those kind of things. And if you want to know about the restoring part, go look in the book of James where he talks about how significant it is when we restore someone to the faith who has drifted away. The, the question is, at the beginning, at the very top, how do I find the way, the best way for me? And we talked about earlier in the class that each one of us is going to have unique talents and capabilities, gifts of the Spirit in ways to be able to 
to do things that will serve. We talked about the, the statement of Jesus where he said, if you give just a cup of cold water to one of the least of these, uh, you, you don't lose your reward. And, and so he's lowered the bar for what we need to do. And uh, so we, we need to start beginning to look for ways to serve so that we'll recognize the Spirit's guidance. And we're going to do that in this class. Uh, we're going we're to go through some things here in a minute that will give you some practical applications, some, some ways that you might get involved. But I want to preface before we get there with this. And that is, don't feel the least bit hesitant to look at a ministry something that we talk about in here or something you see from somewhere else or on the north side and you're looking at what um, what might I be able to do? Where might I be able to make a contribution? And you think of something and you go and you talk to the ministry leader or whoever is involved in that and you, you get involved and, and after a little bit you find it just doesn't seem to be the right fit for me. Folks, there is nothing wrong with that. That can be part of the process of figuring out where that sweet spot is that your specific talents and gifts can be applied to the ministry that God, that God has prepared in advance for you to do. And, and the other thing is, the, the place to start, folks, for all of this is spend time in prayer with God, asking Him to show you the, the things that He has for you. Um, and that's the beginning point. And so, uh, if you start there, and then you start developing that focus, that awareness, that hope that He's going to show us, show you something. Um, and the place, the next place after praying about it is to look at all of these things that we're already doing at Northside. It is amazing. Um, Tim Bennett and his wife, um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use you in, as, as an example, Tim, uh, thanks for joining us today, uh, spent some time earlier in life uh, as missionaries in Thailand. He leads our missions ministry today and does an awesome job of it. And um, we have people in the missions ministry, we're doing so many different things in other parts of the world. And we've got lots of stuff we're doing. But right here at home, we're doing a number of things where we serve the community in ways that we're not asking for or, look or expecting anything in return. And we'll talk some more about those. And so the question is, what are we already doing that you might be able to tie into and find a, uh, a spot that's something that fits for you? The next thing is, if you're looking at something and uh, you don't see it, but you see something somewhere else, Come and let us know. Come tell me. I'll be happy to, to work on that and see. It's not uncommon, however. Be prepared. And this is common with the missions ministry, and Tim can confirm this. It will have people come and say, well, you ought to be doing this. We say, you know, you're right. That's a great work. We should be doing it. You're going to take, take it over and run it, right? Well, no, I just think you all ought to be doing it. It doesn't work that way, folks. So be prepared. If you want to bring an idea, you need to be prepared to be the one to lead the execution of that idea, just, just so you know. Um, but let's look at, again, going back to the Scriptures and looking at the, the, the examples that we've got in the New Testament for what they did. And the apostles and the disciples, when they went out in their mission works, uh, would look for the people that were most likely to be receptive to their message. Well, how did they find them in the first century? They didn't have Facebook. They didn't have the internet. You know, they didn't have all these things that we use to communicate now. Uh, but they went out and they were looking for people who were going to be receptive. The folks that God is already working in their hearts to do. And so look at Acts 16.13. It says, On the Sabbath we went outside the city gate to the river, where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. And um, I'd have to go back and look at the context on which city they were in, but it ended up being a church that they planted. Um, and then the next one, and I love this, this verse, in 17.2, as was his custom. So this was a pattern of things that Paul did on a regular basis. 
And whether he had been given that by the Spirit or figured it out on his own, my, my bet would be is that he got this uh, way of methodology of finding people to minister to and to take the message of Christ to uh, through his prayer relationship with God. And so, as was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue on three Sabbath days. He reasoned with them from the Scriptures. And so here's our question for the class. Who are the people in our surrounding neighborhoods most likely to be interested in the benefits and opportunities of our Northside community? Anybody? Hmm? The homeless, okay. True. Very good. I'm thinking about. It. Let me let me preface that. I'm thinking about the neighborhood right around us primarily, and it's not that there aren't homeless here because we see them on all, on the street corners most most places as well. Um, others. Okay. Something for their kids to do. Um, in the local outreach ministry, we have an advertising budget, and we are, if, you look, if you're on Facebook or Instagram, uh, we have ads that are running now for VBS, which starts uh, 5th of July. And we ran ads for Trunk or Treat last fall, and we had people from the local community show up because of those ads and come to the Trunk or Treat. Um, talking to Nicole, she, had, she recognized, of course, all the parents that were uh, in, in the, the children's ministry, and she saw a number of them and would talk to them and found out they lived nearby and they'd seen our ad, and they came. And that's exactly the kind of thing we're talking about. There's work to do there to put that, uh, the, the, that kind of advertising program together, and we have a budget for it every month where we can have ads for various events uh, that are going on here at Northside. So there are there are those ways. Um, we have a, a talk about, in the next couple of weeks, the SAFE ministry, uh, supporting adoption and fostering efforts. And th that is a very robust program. And there are lots of folks out there who uh, are interested in fostering. Uh, we have a number of members here at Northside who are interested in fostering children or even in adopting children. And we have both. And uh, in talking with them, we find there is a lot of stuff that goes on there that they have needs where there are places for people to serve. Um, and so if we start looking at that, uh, there's some interesting background demographics. And let me give you just an illustration. <clears throat> I looked and you know how you get on the internet and you start researching something and it becomes an, a bottomless rabbit hole. And so this numbers, and I apologize, are from 2010, but the Corporation for National and Community Service estimated in 2010 there were 62.8 million Americans volunteered with a charity. This isn't the folks that were thinking about it, those are the folks that did it. That was 26, over 26% 26 of the, the U.S. adult population in 2010. Folks, it's only gotten bigger. When you see COVID and all of the things that have happened there and the emphasis here locally on the, uh, the, the uh, food bank and charities like that that were helping feed people who had lost jobs because COVID shut everything down, the last two years there's been even greater uh, uh, numbers of that. Well, the other thing that really startled me was, look at the numbers at the bottom. There were 8.1 billion hours of service donated by volunteers. Americans in this country. And if you really think about it, it's not that surprising, but the magnitude of it is, because what that boils down to, if you divide the 8.1 billion hours by the 62.8 million Americans, it's a hundred and average 129 hours a year or 10.75 hours a month or two and a half hours per week, every week, 52 weeks of the year, that Americans, around, all the people around us, are already volunteering and doing things uh, in charitable organizations. So, who are our neighbors and where are they? This is a map, and right about here in the 78258 zip code, I don't know what in the world they were doing when they did this little zigzag, but Northside is right about there on the map, for those of you on this side. Um, right in this little projection of, of the 58 
past Highway 281. Six zip codes. I put this map together in 2019, and at that time, and, and again, the rabbit hole of the internet, I tried to go on the census website and find 2020 numbers from the census itself, not estimates. And, you know, they have so many different databases and stuff, I never could get to that number after a couple of hours of looking. So I'm gonna share with you 2019 numbers, and they're even bigger today. Um, it, these six zip codes ha ha were home to 175,000 people. Of that, if you take the percentage of adults, um, that would be an adult population of about 136,000, almost 137,000 people. If you took the 26.3% of that, that means that about 36,000 people who live right around this building are already involved in volunteering in some way in a charitable organization. Do you think those folks might be interested in doing some of the things that we do here to serve the community? The beauty of some of the things that we're doing here and being Jesus to people is you take loaves and fishes and Judy Biddick is gonna come next week and talk to us in more detail for a few minutes about what they're doing. But the, the thing that, that is fascinating is that there are more people working in the loaves and fishes ministry today than, that are not members at Northside than the number that are members at Northside. Because, and she'll talk about that next week, of how the, I asked her, and I thought it would be one or two answers, and she started talking, and I finally had to cut her off yesterday when we were talking about this, because she starts telling me all of the different ways that people, through contacts that just, just multiply, uh, have found out about the loaves and fishes ministry and said, I'd like to do that. And they come here and help make sandwiches, load the truck, go on the runs, do all the things that loaves and fishes does. And one of the reasons for that is, this is a pure service ministry where we're going out and doing things for people that do not have the ability, they're not gonna come and be members at Northside. You know, the likelihood is we're gonna get to be the people who plant a seed with them but we may not be the people who water that seed or the people who harvest the crop when those people get to a point of in their lives that God has brought them to become part of his family. And so that's fine because that's what he tells us to do, right? I, I love, and, and uh, uh, if Lonnie will permit, I'm gonna use that, that quote from uh, the movie, uh, The Chosen, where the creator, Dallas Jenkins said, it's not our job to feed the 5,000. It's a star job to bring the loaves and the fish. And that's the kind of point to keep in mind. Um, and so many of our neighbors are already involved and we've got an opportunity to talk to them. The, um, the loaves and fish truck goes out three days, three times a week and takes the, the food for free and they minister to people, they take other things, they take socks. Um, and there's a lot of things that can be done there. The other thing that we'll mention this week, a couple of others are Fisher House, where uh, how many of you know what Fisher House is? So for those of you who don't, it is um, a, uh, a residential building at uh, Fort Sam Houston at uh, the Bamsey Medical Center, where they treat the wounded veterans coming back from combat. Um, and there's uh, living quarters there for their families to come in while they're being treated uh, for their wounds and they stay together so that they've got the families. There's also one out at the medical center, I, I suppose maybe next to the VA hospital, I'm not sure. But we have a group that goes out uh, one, at least one Saturday a month and they fi we fix breakfast for them. Glenda and I have done that, it's fascinating. You get to go cook food for them and cook a meal and then sit down and visit with some of them and, and uh, just give them encouragement and uh, be a friend. And that's all that is. But that's a ministry, and that kind of goes back to what David Allen talked about uh, two or three weeks ago. He said, when we're doing something in a, and supporting something in a ministry work that's happening in uh, Ukraine or in China or in Southeast Asia or in Russia somewhere, we are being Jesus to those people by extension. And 
The next one that we mentioned, and, and Mary, thank you for that, that uh, uh, introduction, for think about how many people out of this 175,000, how many families that represents, and what, uh, how many of them might be wanting to adopt or foster children, or they already are, and they need the help and the support. And so uh, the SAFE ministry does a lot of that kind of stuff, works with the local uh, uh, governmental organizations and other non-governmental organizations, and uh, does those kind of things to provide a lot of that support, training, assisting. And one of the things that probably most any of us could do is you go to a little bit of training and you get, uh, I think they have to have a background check and uh, you can babysit for uh, foster parents so that they can have a break and go out and have a date night and you take care of the kids. Sometimes I think they do it here, Tim, I'm not sure if, you, if they do, uh, where they can bring the kids here and drop them off and we've got people that do that. I mean, folks, you know, there's just, it, we get it down to that cup of water level. So we're providing those blessings, but then we're also offering this opportunity for other people to join us. And think about this for a minute. When someone is sitting there thinking about what might I do and someone offers, gives them an offer, an opportunity to do that, it's like, that's just what I was looking for. And they come and do that. I, I did uh, at a job I had uh, many years ago, uh, you know, working for an apartment management company, and we put on uh, benefit promotions uh, here in San Antonio for the battered women's shelter. Uh, and we'd put the promotion on, on the apartment complex, and as, as a marketing tool, partly, uh, and it was very good at that, but also uh, to provide the benefit. And so all of the proceeds for the benefit would go to uh, the battered women's shelter. And what fascinated me and, and all the rest of the other management team is when we were out on the, the site the day of the promotional event, whatever it was, um, we would have residents, because our, our on-site management staff would go and recruit from all of the residents in the apartment complex and ask for help and volunteers. And we'd have these volunteers who'd been out there all day in the heat sweating and working hard. We found out they had worked for weeks in advance to help our staff, our paid uh, staff and the company, uh, prepare for this event. And they would come up to us and thank us for the opportunity to do this, to support this charity. And that was kind of an eye opener. It was like, you know, we didn't have to do anything but lay it out there and say, hey, would you come help us do this? and they appreciated the opportunity. So there's lots and lots and lots of folks around us that would do that. And that's what, to me, is so special about the, the things that we do here in San Antonio where we're serving others, and that is something that other people have already demonstrated, as Judy Biddick will tell us about next week, that they wanna come and be here. And um, what happens is we get those people are then exposed to coming to Northside, coming to services, and it just begins. And it's just like planting the seeds and then watering them and God takes care of the growth. Loaves and fishes. I mean, look at this list of things and, and, and tell me what it is on this list that you don't think you could do. Making sandwiches, assembling, putting stuff in a Ziploc bag, uh, carrying boxes out and loading the trays of sandwiches on the truck. Uh, going downtown with them and, and handing out food to people that line up at the truck. Um, praying with those we serve when we're down there. Uh, all of these things are the things that are so simple. It's literally the cup of cold water uh, area. And so what we're going to find, uh, next week Judy will talk about that, and I'm talking to Rebecca Light about coming and talking about the SAFE ministry. Uh, if you, I would encourage you to go on our website and look at the number of things that are there uh, that the SAFE ministry does because Rebecca has uh, put up a great list uh, that we put up on our, our missions website last year. And uh, it goes into all of the different opportunities. So these are the, the how uh, of what we can do. And that's, as we talked about in the beginning, that's one of the things that I struggle with is you know, we talk about, and, the, and, and David preaches about, and the elders talk about, uh, we need to be more missional. Well, 
I'm a process guy and I want to know, well, okay, what does that mean? What does that look like for me? How do we do that? And so that's what we're trying to do here. But I wanted to show you something and I got past it and I apologize. Um, we also, to give you an idea of uh, how significant this can be for Northside and the influence that we can begin to have in this community. And I want to play a, a video clip from um, Channel 5 News that played some months ago, I think. <coughs> These homeless kids from other countries ignite a fire to serve. Our exchange reporter, Marvin Burst, tells us their service is not stifled by citizenship. The service calendar for Teens Give Back is loaded with opportunities. Assembly lines, filling bags with snacks, toiletries, and socks. In the kitchen, the teens make peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. All of it is for homeless outreach. Getting to wake up a nice home and go to good school and have food on the table is something that a lot of people don't have. Not far from the Toyota plant in South San Antonio, work on a home for Habitat for Humanity. The TGP, as the organization gets called, began in 2007 with students from Alamo Heights and Central Catholic. We want to help our neighbors next door. If there's a need that we hear about in the community, we want to be able to do that. We don't want to only help establish 501c3 organizations. As women with wings walk on stilts through Hemisphere Park, children see the unfolding beauty of butterflies with TGP near the spectrum of knowledge. This is giving you a new perspective on life. Guided by a board of parents, Members from more than 17 schools in San Antonio must complete a minimum of 15 volunteer hours a year. Like back in April, when a contact told them migrant children housed in the Freeman Coliseum required help. I mean, those wealth and games, there's 2,000 kids, they are age 13 to 17, that have nothing but the clothes on their back. They're bored, they have no privacy, they don't know where their parents are, they don't know where some of their siblings are. And just as hard as they push nails for a habitat home, the TGB got busy. They put together a drop that produced more than expected. It was anywhere from 800 to 2,000 items. Items that may seem like nothing to some are comforting to children from a foreign land. You can also see how sports and playing games would be a great way to pass the time and forget about all the other things going on. St. PJ's is an emergency shelter for children who need a haven from abusive and neglected situations. We provide a home to both children, the unaccompanied minors, as well as our uh, stateside children. They also house migrant kids for the federal government. Donations are vital for St. PJ's to meet the need of the children who stay an average of 58 days, especially those who will see Christmas here. We're very generous because we don't know where they will end up next. Just like the donation the TGB gave to the migrant kids who went to St. PJ's. That spirit is welcome all the time, especially during the holidays. I love when kids uh, help us out. As boundless as the butterflies they teach about this Saturday, so floats their desire to make a difference, unfazed by border politics. Yes, these are people and they need our help. It didn't matter and nothing else mattered. In September, the teens also gave backpacks to the children of Afghan refugees fleeing from their country. I would hope that someone who was in a better situation would help my own child. Giving back is a part of their name and character. Trying to help people get the things, hopefully get back on track. For those who may need to see, humanity can be so easy. Even a child can do. Marvin Brooks, Kids 5, I need this news. Did you catch that last line? It's so easy, even a child can do it. I don't see any kids in here, but I see a lot of people who can do something. 
and that's what I uh, we're talking about, and wanting to encourage everyone to do uh, as we go through. Uh, any other questions or comments? Jerry's giving me a thumbs up. I remember to turn the mic back on. <laughs> Questions, thoughts? Mary? Hopefully the route of the energy that's done here at Northside will be in our own community, in, in our own residence where we live. This yes. One of the things that stated that there are a lot of times people can't come to the place where we worship, but we can take our place of worship to them. Just when you go to the mailbox, when mm -hmm. you come home from work, don't just let the garage up and then let it down and I want to show you one thing that all of you can do. It's very easy. And you can pick these cards up and the envelopes uh, out here on the kiosk. I think they're straight across the, the uh, atrium there. Um, how many people know a lady named Sally May? Sally, did I and No? Yes, a couple. My wife says I know. Um, at the very beginning of Northside, the May family were some of our uh, uh, charter members. Uh, Lawrence was uh, ultimately president of one of the largest banks in San Antonio. And uh, Sally's ministry, she had, she bought, uh, Northside didn't do this kind of thing then, but she had envelopes this same size and they were um, robin's egg blue, I guess you'd call it, or sky blue, about the color of Marvin's tie. And nobody else sent those like that. Thank you, Marvin. But she would write cards to people at Northside. And she would just tell you that she appreciated something she saw you do. And I can't tell you, I, got, I remember getting two of them. Well, I was, I was teaching a class with a good friend of mine one time, and there were about 50 of us in there, and we were all in our uh, probably uh, late 30s, early 40s, most of us. And I asked that question, how many of you have gotten one of these little blue envelopes from Sally May? And over three quarters of the class raised their hand. I said, okay, now put your hands down if you've only gotten one. And about half the class had gotten more than one, two or more. And I said, and I started going down around and asking, well, what did you think of it? Oh, that was so sweet. It, was, it made such an impact on me. It, it just, to get it in the mail, where somebody takes the time to handwrite a note, handwrite my name and address on it, and put that stamp on there, and they're so thoughtful, and it conveys, just getting it conveys a lot of messages. And then there's the message she actually would write, which was always uplifting and appreciative and graceful. And folks, we especially in this age where most communication now is electronic, for somebody to get something in the mail that someone takes the time to handwrite a note can have a massive impact on that person. And so I would encourage you to pick up a stack of them and I'm gonna, uh, okay, Jesus says we're supposed to confess to one another, so I will. You can see this stack. It has been sitting on my bookshelf for about three years. It wasn't any bigger when I brought it home. So this was good intentions, but I haven't followed through on it. So I would encourage you, take five or six, you know, and, uh, and when you've used those up, get some more, uh, or buy your own of some sort. And, and look for people. If you wrote one, for instance, who could, who could you write to? Suggestions, thoughts? Some, some person here at Northside, um, you say, this week I'm going to write a note to somebody. I think it's a list that goes, well, there are two lists. There's a free daily list that goes up on Facebook that has a place to sometimes have a picture, but there's also a list that goes out um, in the bulletin. So there are two different ways. And then, because everyone who's a member is a part um, of the Northside group, can look into the dictionary, the uh, directory, and find the address. So you get three different ways to do that. 
our prayer list, our pray, pray for a person today. And so there's one of those every, week, every day of the week. And, um, and then, what was the third one? Oh, just going into the directory. Yeah, the Alexio directory. And so those are some of the things that are so easy to do and to start with and to find. And let's go back to, and we'll close with this verse, the Philemon 6, where Paul wrote to Philemon and he said, I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith so that you will have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. And we talked about in the very first class that that means not just sharing our faith with someone else outside of the body of Christ, but with each other. Because just like that interchange I told you about with uh, Rod Cyrus a few minutes ago that was very uplifting for me in having that very brief conversation, he was sharing elements of his faith and his perspective on faith it gave me a new way to look at it. And that's, that built up both of us. And so that sharing is something that is very important for us to do. It's why we have life groups and various other things where we get together during the week and we do things outside of this building. Um, Bob, would you be willing to lead us in a closing prayer? Thank you.